month ago, uh, as you see on your, uh, your chair, some of you already picked it up and started to look at it, we released a case study called Government Privatization in Missouri by David Stokes. David is our Director of Local Government Policy. And it has already received a, a good amount of attention across the state, we're happy to say. Uh, in that month since then, we have had seven radio interviews, six op-eds placed around the state, two newspaper stories, major stories focusing on this case study, both in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Kansas City Star. And those of you who are familiar with the policies of the Star and the Post know that that's pretty good achievement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also one radio commentary. David did a radio commentary for KWMU here in St. Louis. So we've received a good amount of attention on this. We're very proud of that, and we think this is a very important issue. And we're glad that uh, you came today to, to hear more about it. So without further ado, Dave Stokes. Dave. Thank you, Rick. Thank you all for coming out today. A couple local tales as to, how, as to how this works. And what privatization is, is it is the performance of public services via the private sector. And I'm going to use the term privatization during this talk very loosely. I mean, privatization can be a whole bunch of things. It can be the outright sale of a public asset to the private sector, like a utility, which is then completely owned and operated by the private sector, often with some degree of regulation. It can be various forms of long-term leasing, like the Chicago Skyway, where they leased out their, their city-owned toll road for 99 years. It can be simple outsourcing, which is probably the most common way to, to do it. So I'm going to put all those things in when I say privatization. And if there's any specific example where I'm talking about where you want me to be a little more specific about exactly what they did, I will, I will be happy to attempt to do so. We have a great example. I mean, why should you care? We're always trying to talk about why should you care? And let's start off with the county pharmacy, because I think that's just such a successful example of privatization and done in a bipartisan fashion with a pragmatic focus. And the economic literature on this is clear. And my own personal experience working at it when I was at St. Louis County agrees that privatization works best when it's done from a focus of pragmatism, not ideology. It's hard work to make, to put the bids out and to review the bids and to supervise and manage the contracts. So the great privatizers in, in de democratic history, people like you know, Prime Minister Thatcher, Governor Engler of Michigan, Rudy Giuliani in, in New York. I mean, Mayor Giuliani saved New York City over $6 billion, privatized 66 different services in, in his term. Sure, they had the ideology to support it, but more importantly, they had the willingness to do the hard work necessary to make it work and to, and to oversee it, to enforce the parts of the deal. Because in privatization, government still has a major role to play in oversight. But you know, if you could go to the next. This is the data from the St. Louis County Pharmacy. This is a, a very interesting story. Uh, I worked in, if you don't know, I worked for St. Louis County for six years. I was an aide to former county councilman Kurt Odenwald, and I was on the council when we, I was a, an aide on the council when they did this. Back in the late 90s, St. Louis County is the only county health department in the state that operates a pharmacy. And this paper, in issues big and small, is not about whether or not we should be delivering these services. That's a different debate, and I believe in limited government, so there's probably some things in here that I would argue we shouldn't. But that's not the point of the discussion. It's how are these services going to be delivered is what I'm here to talk about. So St. Louis County, we are the largest county in the state. I mean, if anybody's going to have a county health department pharmacy, I guess it should be St. Louis County. In the late 90s, prices really started to increase to manage the health department pharmacy. And like a, how the pharmacy operates, it's, it's open to every resident of St. Louis County, but like most local health clinic issues, you, you sort of pay for it on a sliding scale. So if you really have absolutely no money and need the drugs, you can get it for free. Most people, you know, just get a discount on their drugs purchased through St. Louis County. They don't pay for it for free. And then once you get to a certain, maybe twice poverty, uh, then you lose your discount, so there's no benefit to most people using it, so you just use your private doctor or your private pharmacy. So it's, it serves low-income people, and it does a good job 
at that. But it does an even better job thanks to privatization. So look at these numbers. 2.3 million in 97, up to 5.8 million just a few years later, up to 6.5 million in 2002. I'm not attributing all of this just to poor management. I mean, healthcare costs were increasing. Uh, the county <coughs> opened a new jail about the time. Now, they had an existing jail in Chesterfield, and prisoners in the jail are counted in these totals. But the new jail in Clayton was larger and, and carried more, protected more people. So that's part of the explanation. It's not all. Some of, the, some of these costs are very understandable. But after this almost tripling in uh, six years there, the Westfall administration, most of you here probably recall, former county executive Buzz Westfall, they, in 2002 they looked into privatizing the system. And they went out to bid to companies like Walgreens and pharmacy management companies. They said, what can you do to take over control of this system to serve the people in St. Louis County who use it? And they got a lot of bids back right away. I think there was about three for the first first year, real serious ones, and Walgreens won it. And right away, you can see the cost savings started, started to occur. It went down half a million, half a million more, bumped up a little bit. But it's, these are not uh, adjusted for inflation terms. These are, these are the real dollars for the county health department pharmacy. So now, in 2014, and I'll say about here, they rebid it and Walgreens lost the bid to a company called LDI, which is a local pharmacy benefits management company. It's not as well known as Express Scripts, but it's another local one. And of course, Walgreens didn't really care because Walgreens works with LDI, so there's Walgreens still getting half of these, half of these pharmacy, kind of, half of the pharmacy fillings. But LDI has maintained it since then, and they just competitively bid it out again two years ago. So you, now, at some point in here, they split the correctional medicine costs off from the, from the pharmacy, so you have to sort of add that back in. But let's talk about how significant these cost savings are. In 2014, and they've expanded services since then in the correctional facility, you could add the 1.5 million to the 4.8 million for the pharmacy budget line, and you still have less than they were spending in 2002. And that's a dozen years later, with higher salaries and higher taxes and rents and everything. Now, again, now all this is a, is a miracle of privatization. Uh, Generic drug prices around 2009, sort of a lot of major generics sort of really started to drop. So some of this cost savings is explained by generic drug savings. Not all of the prisoners in particular, which are a major part of this, uh, are very difficult to switch to generics in testimony I've, I've read and studied. So, so you can't just put everybody on a generic. But you're still spending less in 2014 for an expanded service than you were in 2002, and I think that's all due to privatization. What's more important is that services improved at the same time. This isn't just a cost savings measure. Before privatization, there was one county pharmacy. It was a store up in North County. The people in the county who used it, they had to go there. It was open normal government hours. You had to go there in person to get your prescription. It didn't have any of the modern technology that we sort of assume exist with, with pharmacies and have for some time. The moment they privatized it, they went from one store to 100 Walgreens in the, in the area, or 50 Walgreens, whatever the number is, open 24 hours with ordering by phone, fax, all that. All these services that you and I take for granted were now available to the county residents who use the county pharmacy. And when LDI took over control around 2006, I should say won the contract as opposed to took control. This isn't the Crimea. <laughs> they won the contract. They included all sorts of neighborhood pharmacies in, in their circuit of delivery. So now there's hundreds of pharmacies, big chains or small neighborhood pharmacies that participate in this program that people in it can use. So you're saving taxpayers money, which is extremely important. You're providing better services to the people who use it, which is extremely important. And it's just and it was done in a completely pragmatic-based, bipartisan focus, so done under a Democratic administration, on a Republican majority at the time, county council, but done with full support of all members of the council. And I'm not here to talk politics, just statement of fact. Uh, county Executive Dooley has continued the program and been a strong supporter of it since he went into to office as well. Again, just laying out facts as, as they are. So it's just such a, that's why I got interested. The moment I joined Show Me Institute, in 2007, I wanted to start writing about this issue because I was so interested in it from going through the process with the county in 2003. 
So what's another, there's another great example about three, what's that, three blocks west of here? Forest Park. So many, ex the city of St. Louis deserves a lot of credit for the way it's managed Forest Park. And I'm not just talking about its partnership with Forest Park Forever, which is also an amazing thing, but that's a, that's a, a charitable work where they partner together. There are so many successful examples of privatization in that park. My dad and my stepmother live on Aberdeen, uh, right across the street from Skinker. So their house is right across from the, the famous old ninth hole, the old par six that some of you may recall. I, was, I never played it as a par six, but played it as a par five all the time. And I grew up playing there regularly with, with my dad, in like a preteen. And I remember how bad that course used to be in the famous old flat nine where like the, a golfer in his first time out could shoot in the mid 40s because the course was so easy. And, the, and they privatized that in the late 80s, I think in 1988. They outsourced the management of that golf course to a, a private golf course management company. And I remember at the time, and anybody who played it probably doesn't remember, that the course really started to get better. And then in the mid 90s, that company, American Golf Management Company, I think is its name, it's since changed then to a different company's won the bid. They invested a great deal of money in that course. And if anybody here plays the municipal golf course over in Forest Park, Hawthorne and Redbud and the other the three nine hole systems they have, you'll know how great that course is now and how much better it used to be. And my, my father, who doesn't agree with me on politics on anything, will regularly admits that yes, the private management of that course was a complete success. The city doesn't have any risk in that course now. The company pays them rent each year. They pay them, I've got it in the report, I think it's about $300,000 a year. And I think there's some profit sharing agreement as there should be in these deals. If the profit gets, goes, is very successful, you should have to share some of that with the government. But you know, the, the city still owns it. But the private company manages it and does it very successfully. The city gets the rent, gets the money from it, doesn't take in any risk at all, doesn't have to man a golf course. And so much of privatization is really about core government functions. It's about government doing what government is best at, public safety, uh, primarily public safety, is the main thing that should really never be privatized under any situation. And we'll get into that a little more. But there's other examples over there as well. I was talking about Creve Coeur earlier with their, with their golf course in, in Ice Rink. Forest Park, the city of St. Louis has privatized the management of Steinberg Ice Rink over there. That's been run by a private company for years now that pays the city rent and then operates the ice rink, keeps it open the four or five months a year and sells food, sells beer. So they make money off of that. And I, lo I love taking my kids to that ice rink. The private company does, does great. The Boathouse restaurant over in Forest Park, complete, completely privately operated, very successfully. Uh, and then perhaps most famously, although as a, it's always been private and, the go and even the staunchest supporters of government, big government wouldn't think you should run a municipal opera. I mean, obviously the Muni over there has been private since its inception a uh, hundred years ago as a nonprofit. And I'm not here to talk about the Muni, that's a different item, but it is an example of how nonprofits can play a role Privatization needn't always be with a for-profit company. The St. Louis, the St. Louis region is actually home to nationwide one of the strongest examples of, of the history of privatization through the private streets that some people in, in this audience probably live on. A century ago, and, and more recently too, many of the subdivisions and neighborhood associations built in St. Louis, uh, and many of them, particularly in the center corridor, uh, were completely private under the private place model where the neighborhood itself owned the streets, owned the sewers, managed the security, managed all the land use regulations through indentures. And government really wasn't, was so less involved in how those neighborhoods operated than they are now. And it was, as we all know, we can and just envision all the neighborhoods in the Central West End and in Clayton and in New City, and, and that model has gone further throughout the area, but those, in those cities, it's the dominant model, or at least was, as of a few decades ago, it's sort of changed in recent years. It's declined in use over the past several decades. A lot of this was done a century ago because the government was just not in a position to do it. The city of St. Louis was not in a position to build the sewers for these neighborhoods out in the central west end, so they just did it themselves when they were built a century ago. And of course, MSD took over all the cities about, I'm sorry, took over all the sewers about 50 years ago. A lot of the streets 
are still privately operated, but some of them tend to be going more and more into public control now as, as cities get better at that. There are neighborhoods in Clayton that have formed transportation development districts or community improvement districts just to operate their streets. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's very interesting to, to me. It's, uh, the land zoning has been incorporated over all these communities now, although to, to be told, the zoning often just reinforces the indentures as opposed to replacing the indentures. I live on a private street in University City and uh, I enjoy that very much. But the tax, one of the other reasons this has declined in popularity is the tax benefits to it no longer exist. A hundred years ago, if you were paying for all these things yourself, I think there were, you were paying less in taxes in other ways. Nowadays, if you live on a private street, you pay the same tax to St. Louis or U City or Clayton for the streets that you would if you didn't. You just have to pay to maintain your own streets as, as well. And this is, I mean, this is, there are people who study this issue nationwide and St. Louis is their focus for private neighborhoods and that type of thing. And I would call this an early version of Sandy Springs, Georgia. And what Sandy Springs, Georgia is, is, is a fully privatized city. It was created about a decade ago, a little longer than a decade, the suburb of Atlanta. It took, it tried to incorporate for several decades before they were finally allowed to. And when they did, they contracted out everything in that city, except for police and fire, which by law in Georgia, they're not allowed to contract out, in which they shouldn't. Nobody is, I, I'm gonna talk about police and prisons here in a few minutes. Those should be done by the government. And private, fire privatization can be done. It's done nowhere in Missouri, and there's many, many other better examples for it. I don't think it really should be done, although it does exist. So Sandy Springs, Georgia, when they incorporated, contracted out with CH2M Hill, the nationwide engineering and, and architectural company. They've got offices in St. Louis. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. They managed everything in Sandy Springs, permitting, inspections, road maintenance, on and on and on. Anything that the city offered went through the CH2M Hill and the people they assigned to manage Sandy Springs, except again for police and fire. And it's proven very, very popular. Uh, how is it very popular? Well, over a decade later, they still have the exact same system in place. After, they broke up the contract. Whereas they, at first, they gave it all to CH2M Hill. A few years later, they broke the contract in about five different things and had multiple people bid in, so they saved even more money that way. But the mayor, who, who was the founder behind the incorporation movement and the, early, the biggest backer of it, she's still in office. She's an economist, by the way, which I think is, is a, not surprising. We need more economists in public office. But it's just, and I like to joke, although it's not really a joke, I don't want, I don't want to die until every city in Missouri is operating under the Sandy Springs model of, a, of management or something close to it. As we were doing the, the case study, we hit upon an excellent experiment because in doing the research for it, we learned that Kansas City provides an excellent test case because Kansas City, if you're familiar with Kansas City, it's a very long north to south city. And in the northern parts of the city, up in Clay and Platte County, and in the far southern parts of the city, they contract out their trash service to private companies, and they bid it out like, like any other bid. For the center part of the city, they operated as a municipal utility. They're just a city-owned trash service like a St. Louis does. So we thought instantly, wow, great test case. So we got the numbers. This was not hard to do. All this was public in Kansas City's budget and comprehensive annual financial reports and an annual trash service report that they put out and, and long-range planning for their trash service. So it was easy to do. We found the city hauler serves 46,000 dwellings, about 47,000. The private hauler, about 94,500 dwellings. And like most places, commercial entities are entirely private. And when we talk about city trash service, it's almost always houses and small apartment buildings. The, the businesses are, handle their own trash service. What is the total expense for the city hauler? 4.2 million a year. The private haulers, I should say haulers because it's two contracts, about $6 million a year. Total square miles and dwellings per square mile, this is important because trash service is something that benefits from density. The denser your area, the more cost effectively you're gonna be able to do trash service. So it's important for this point that the city part of central Kansas City is, is more dense than the areas that the private haulers contract. But then, so we just ran, ran these numbers here. Annual expense per dwelling for the private haulers, about $63 per house slash small apartment building. For the city hauler, about $90. 
if you were actually ran it expense per square mile, the difference gets dramatic, but you know, that, I think that's probably overstated the actual, I think the cost per dwelling at $27 per year is a better, more reasonable example of cost savings. So here's just a very good example of, of how the private haulers in Kansas City are saving taxpayers money. And because the city is managing, the city may, requires the same level of service for both of these areas. So I don't think there's much in the way of service differential here. I think that's probably basically exactly the same. Just cheaper to use the private haulers. And one of the things I loved about doing this study is this isn't an anti-government study at all. It's finding examples where government uses privatization successfully and commends them. So I think Kansas City deserves credit for contracting out two-thirds of the city. That's the way I look at it here. And, and when it comes up again, I'd love to see them consider the center corridor for privatization or to do what Indianapolis and some other cities have done successfully, allow those public employees to come up with their own bid, to let them sort of participate in the privatization process, to sort of let them give good ideas on how to do it better too. I mean, Indianapolis had some very successful examples of doing things just like that. Question, Lee? Did you ever determine what, what it is that caused the differential between these two? Not, a, not in this one, but generally speaking, there's no point denying or hiding that the private contractors in these cases often pay a little bit less than, than the public employees. Too often, I think, government serves as a, a jobs program. That, that said, I don't think the salary differences are particularly high. I think it's probably a lot less in benefits to the employees of the private contractors, be it trash or, or, a, or any other service. I think the salary and benefits are going to be more in line with market-based salaries and benefits out there as opposed to government, government salary and benefits, which are particular benefits higher. So no point denying that you're probably paying less and saving money that way. Generally speaking, you're probably operating more efficiently, meaning fewer employees required. That's a good thing. Uh, layoffs, interestingly enough, I was going to touch on this layer, but I'm, I can touch on it now. When services are privatized, actual layoffs are actually pretty rare. Uh, generally speaking, on average, in a study that's about 15 years old now, so it might be slightly dated, a study found that when, and this, was, well, this wasn't about Missouri, this, or one specific one, this was a mega study of many different privatizations, they found that about 58% of the public employees just went straight to the private employee. Just, they were working for, did the exact same thing. They were working for the government one day, working in the private sector the next day. About a quarter of the public employees transferred to other jobs within government. They didn't go to the private sector, but they just stayed on doing exactly, working for the same government. You hear so often when you hear about government cuts, and you heard a lot of that in the, in the Great Recession here, as governments were cutting back. They were always eliminating positions, if you heard the term, and they rarely eliminated actual people. They had unfilled positions that they would eliminate. Actual layoffs of people are rare. And you get to, for privatization, you get to about 7%. That's your number of public employees who are actually laid off due to privatization, 7%. Because those numbers I gave, 58% a quarter, and then about 7% of people just retire. Those would be people who've hit their pensions in most cases and just don't want to deal with the change and just decide that's a good point to, to retire. So, so general efficiency improvements and lower salary and particular benefits are the two major reasons for cost savings. I think. Not to, and the third one is just the benefits of competition. When you're going to rebid this out every five years, I mean, LDI knows that if they don't keep offering a great bid to St. Louis County, Express Scripts is going to come in at the next bid opportunity and outbid them. And, and win that contract. So, so that is why it is so important to keep bidding things. There was a minor scandal in Baldwin last year where it came out that they were, they just renewed their trash contract for another 10 years to a private company without putting it out to, to bid. Just sort of, the mayor signed on it and a few council members objected and screamed, but it, it went through without any type of a bid process. I think that's completely inappropriate and you need to be willing to rebid these contracts at a at a, at a regular schedule. There are certain really high infrastructure, high capital investment things such as highway leases that deserve long-term long -term deals. Short of that, things shouldn't be really any more than five-year contracts at most. So, so the Kansas City office, once we ran the numbers, we really showed how Kansas City is saving, 
saving taxpayers money there. And now we'll move on to the next one where we'll sort of just talk about some general examples. Next slide, Joe. Including some, including some fun ones, which we'll get to. And please, questions at, at any point. Prioritization can, it can save taxpayers money. It can sometimes do better services for the same amount of money. And sometimes, like in the pharmacy, it can do both. A good example of doing better service for the same amount of money is the Independence Mass Transit System. Uh, about three years ago, Independence, which is a very large suburb of Kansas City, was not satisfied with the bus service they were getting from KC, Kansas City's ATA, which is their version of Metro. So they looked into privatizing their system. They went to a private charter bus company, First Transit, and said, what can you do for us here in Independence? And it, the First Transit came in and said, we can do a lot. Of, here's what we'll offer. Meet the same level of service, and we'll do it for about $650,000 a year less. So that's, Independence is a big city, so that's not pennies, but, but it's, it's still real money there. So now, instantly, the public employee sector sued Independence as soon as this contract w went out, this proposal went out. And that it happens a lot. I mean, public employees are going to fight back against privatization proposals in a lot of cases. So what Independence ended up doing was instead of cutting the service and spending less, they decided to use First Transit to augment the existing service they had from ATA. So they found that they could basically spend the same amount of money so they didn't have to deal with major cuts or layoffs to ATA, and that sort of, I believe, solved their lawsuit problems. But they found ATA or First Transit could come in and for a reasonable amount of money expand what they offered. So basically for the same amount of money they were spending five years ago, they've got a si system now that's about 30 to 40 percent larger. Longer hours, more routes for the people. So that's an example where they're getting more service for the same amount of money through privatization. But let's talk about some of the low-hanging fruit of privatization in Missouri. Because what, what we're really proud about in this study is we researched Big cities, small towns, big counties, small counties, all over the state. Got examples, north, south, east, and west, of examples where this, where this is working. And what we hope for, what's the goal of this case study? The goal is that elected officials, citizen activists, and, and others around the state will read it and take it to their, take it to their local officials and say, we, we should consider some of this for, for our city. I want people to have a light bulb go off in their head and say, We've been doing X service by the city for 60 years. I had no idea that the city 30 miles away did, it, did the same thing by the private sector. We want serve, well, I had a friend who had sort of that light bulb moment when I talked about this to him, because he was from Poplar Bluff. And, I was, and so I gave him a Poplar Bluff example of how all the ambulance service in, in Poplar Bluff and Cape Girardeau, and the same as North St. Louis County, is privately operated. And he just sort of jumped. He said, you know, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a government ambulance service until I came to St. Louis for Wash U and realized up here, you did it by the government. I want sort of the reverse light bulb moment for people to have the, the opposite reaction. <laughs> well, that's sort of what we're going for. I talked about golf courses. There are many municipal golf courses around, around the state, University City, Creve Corps, where I think those governments, government shouldn't operate a golf course. Governments should contract with companies that have expertise in golf course management and use them. We're not talking about asset sales here. I call this specialized recreation management. It's very controversial, politically difficult, in many cases outright illegal, to privatize a park. Nobody wants to do that. You're talking about outsourcing the management of certain things within parks. It's, it's very, very different. Uh, golf courses, swimming pools, um, Wentzville. There's a city, you're familiar with it in St. Charles. A couple of years ago, they were, they're redoing their swimming pool, so they put out management, they put out bids to manage it. And um, Midwest Pool Management Company came back uh, and said their bid was $3,000 a year less than what Wentzville was spending on it. Now, that's not a lot of money, but Wentzville, I mean, that's not New York City. $3,000 means something to Wentzville. And what's more, they're getting a company managing it now where that's all they do is manage swimming pools. And one, what does, how, what does that mean? How does that really improve? Well, one example is that these companies are faster to, to upgrade to better technology. I gave the pharmacy example where phone service, internet orders, fax orders, whatever you want. Let's talk about where we are in St. Louis here, just sort of the worst counter example to it, where the city water division, and I've harped on this for years, some of the people in this room have heard me talk about it, we still don't have water meters 
in homes in the city of St. Louis. The city water division has never input water meters. This is a technology that was invented 100 years ago and was almost universally adopted, including by most public water companies, almost 50, 60 years ago. Everybody had water meters. I mean, it's sort of unheard of that you don't have water meters in homes in the city of St. Louis now. You can live, you can have a home in the city, you can water your lawn every day so that your gardens are like the gardens of Shangri-La. You can have the most elaborate garden in, in yard in the entire city. You will pay not a penny more than your neighbor for, on your water bill who never, waters, who never waters their lawn. That's how absurd that is. It's just sort of an extreme example of failure to adopt technology by a public, because the St. Louis City, of course, is a city water division. Gas and electric are all private, but, but water is public. And to be fair, most other public water divisions have adopted that technology a long time ago. So that's more a rip on the city water division than public water, generally speaking. Swimming pools regularly contracted out. Um, fleet management. I love the fleet management example, and not just because Missouri is particularly equipped to deal with it. Governments own a ton of cars and trucks. Uh, you might not think about it very often, but they do. Park fleets, highway management fleets, uh, sometimes politicians or, or managers get take-home cars, on and on and on. I mean, St. Louis County itself, if you add in the police cars, I mean, it owns thousands of vehicles. Fleet management is an excellent opportunity for companies to provide governments with those cars and manage the fleet. Uh, Benton County is a small county in central Missouri. About uh, six, seven years ago, they noticed that for their, for their health department, for employees who were driving their own cars all around the county for health department visits, that those reimbursements at about you know, 52, 53 cents a mile were getting very expensive. So they put out to bid managing the about 15 cars in that fleet, and Enterprise, and presumably others, Enterprise One, went in and said, look, we'll provide you with leased automobiles that you can give to your employees. Here's what it'll cost you. And then if a car breaks down, we'll replace it. If, if a, you know, after a few years, when a car is no longer serviceable, we'll take it out and do what Enterprise, whatever they do with old cars. They saved $38,000 in that first year in the Benton County Health Department. That's just one department in one small county. I mean, that's real money. And Enterprise does this around the country. They have a contract with Virginia to provide emergency vehicles to, to employees. And then you talk about an example where all sorts of cities and counties and, and school districts around this state can save money by, instead of owning their own fleets and owning hundreds of vehicles, or in the case of small cities and towns, dozens of vehicles, they can just contract with Enterprise or Budget or whomever to manage those fleets and save taxpayers money while at the same time providing newer, better cars to the to public employees who use it. Animal control is a great example and one of the prime examples of the role of nonprofits in this. There are cities and counties all around the state that have contracted with their local humane society or other animal welfare organizations to operate their shelters. But Kansas City's done this twice. They did it with a for-profit veterinarian, and that saved money. They did this about five years ago, and in that first year, the Kansas City private operators saved the city $175,000 and reduced euthanasia by 37%. However, it still wasn't, they, obviously they still did, it was still a kill shelter, so some of the volunteers there started objecting to the management style of the veterinarian who took over, so the city took it back out of that, uh, instantly prices increased to operate the shelter, so Kansas City then went to a local, I think the Jackson County ASPCA, and, and contracted with them to manage it. And that's done. Uh, Chillicothe, Missouri, has contracted with their County Humane Society for decades, very effectively, to operate their animal shelters. St. Louis County, big animal shelter. St. Louis City, big animal shelter. And I think St. Louis City is, has now started working with Stray Rescue to do some of these goals in the city. It's a great way to, to harness the power of active volunteers that many of these nonprofits have, to harness their expertise in the matter, and save taxpayers money all, all at the same time. So I would, I would hope that in a few years you'll see far more use of private animal control or animal welfare organizations and animal control. Public safety support services. This is a good example, a good time for me to talk about what you should not privatize. First and foremost, uh, pol police should not ever be privatized. The power to arrest and deprive somebody of liberty should only belong to the government through, through, the, through the people, not to the private sector. 
fire services, as I said, it's never going to happen in Missouri. It's not coming here, so, so no, po no point. The only thing that is privatized around this country that should not be is, in my opinion, uh, private prisons. I think the incentives for private prisons are way out of whack. Missouri does not make use of any private prisons. So there are about, about half the states either don't use them at all or use them very, at a very low level. But about half the states use it significantly. And I think, I'm glad Missouri doesn't. I would hope Missouri never will. And this includes at the state level or local levels. The incentives that make privatization work in all these other fields, I think are out of whack when it comes to holding somebody in a prison. What I mean by that is where you have private prisons, you very quickly get to the point where those companies start lobbying for harsher penalties for crimes. And you've, you've seen this, we give examples in the paper. They'll go to the state legislature and they'll start lobbying that this crime should have a harsher punishment so that those people stay in prison longer so that the company can get, can get more money. Uh, we've heard exam I've heard examples, and this isn't in the study. It's, I, I can't verify it, although the, where I got it from, I think it's a very legitimate source, that in Vegas, the private prisons, in Las Vegas, the private prisons were going and getting homeless people and like arresting, having them arrested with cop, having cops arrest the homeless for loitering and they'd keep them in jail for a night and then they'd have to release them because they never charged them with anything, but they could bill the government for that, for that one night of stay of the, the homeless person for loitering. So the incentives don't work. And I think it's very, I think it's deeply troubling. Some of you may recall about 15 years ago, Missouri briefly experimented with private prisons, sent a number of prisoners down to Texas where there was a sort of a staff riot, if you recall the videos that were aired on the news, where he showed videos emerged of the staff of this private prison beating the, beating the Missouri prisoners. They were quickly pulled back and the state hasn't used it since. So, so I don't support private prisons and I hope, I hope Missouri continues to not use them. That said, there are support services within pro public safety that absolutely can be privatized. Things like the, well, the jail pharmacy, uh, a jail cafeteria, uniforms for, for police. I mean, there's all sorts of these support services where I think there are good roles. And most of this stuff is not very controversial. Sure, the, pu the public employees who fear the change are going are gonna to fight, and sometimes it can be moderately controversial, but cities can do this. You can outsource the management of your golf course and you're probably not gonna have a, a riot in your street, as opposed to if you try to sell that golf course, you're going to have, a, you very well will have that riot. There's also a lot of bigger things which can be privatized and very effectively, but you, if you're gonna do it as a city, you should expect uh, a fight. You should expect a great deal of controversy. Utilities are something that I find very interesting and also a good nature about how, a good example of how the political background of this doesn't always break down as you would assume. Let's talk about St. Louis County. It's one of the largest counties in the state. I'm gonna wrap this presentation up in about two minutes and just go to questions. It's one of the largest counties in the state where all the utilities are, pri not the state, I'm sorry, in the country, where all the utilities in St. Louis County are private. Gas, electric, water. Springfield, Missouri, sort of the, the conservative heartland of the state of Missouri, has, has a giant monolithic city utility that does that does all their city, that does everything in, in Springfield. It's called city utilities, simply enough. They operate all the gas, all the electric, all the water, all the transit. They do all of that you know, publicly. And if you tried to break that up and privatize, as I've been arguing for years now, I mean, you would have a political fight of all political fights there. Um, in a place like St. Louis City and Kansas City, or Kirkwood, I think that the main steps to take they should sell off their water divisions. I think they should sell them to the private sector. And Florissant and Webster Groves did that uh, about 12 years ago. And some of the people living here, here today may li have lived in Florissant or Webster, been familiar with that. Florissant sold its water company to Missouri American for $14.5 million in 2002. At the exact same time, Webster Groves sold it for $9 million. Uh, I think the average person who lives in those cities barely even knew it happened. And that's the good thing. I'm not saying it shouldn't be transparent. It was and it needed to be. But the service level for the average person, you never really noticed a difference between day to day. And that's the way it should be. Florissant took that money, spent about $2 million of it on immediate needs, put, about, uh, put the rest of it in a long-term savings fund for the city, which helped them get through 
the financial difficulties of 2007, 2008, that they had this money in a reserve fund. Where is Missouri? I told earlier where Missouri was ahead of the curve on privatization on um, local neighborhoods. Where are we behind the curve? One area jumps out, and that is toll roads and the private financing of infrastructure. This has real cost to our state because we have infrastructure needs in redoing I-70 and soon, within a decade, probably I-44, that if we allowed private investment in infrastructure, as more and more states are starting to do, I think we could address those needs better without having to raise taxes. That said, I'm not an opponent of a gas tax increase. So if that was the proposal, I'd be out supporting it. MoDOT proposed this two years ago, uh, contracting with a private company to finance redoing I-70, expand it, and pay off those bonds with tolls that company would collect. I thought it was an outstanding idea. I uh, strongly supported it. Unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't occur. We have one toll road in the state. If you've been to Party Cove, you might have driven over it in the Ozarks, Lake Ozark Community Bridge. It's not a private entity, I want to be clear. It is sort of, it's a transportation development district, so it is public. But it's also been an effective way to meet transportation needs in the Ozarks. A lot of people are surprised about ambulance services. Uh, North St. Louis County, all the ambulances in there for about two, 300,000 people are privately operated through the whole, part, the whole part of it. I don't think a lot of people realize that. Christian Hospital has an enormous ambulance service that's been providing ambulances in North County for decades, doing it very cost effectively. It's very popular. Cities and fire districts up there all contract with Christian, with Christian Hospital. In Cape Girardeau and Poplar Bluff, private companies do all the ambulance services. In the counties around Springfield, not Springfield itself, but around Springfield, all the ambulances are private. Uh, it's, it can be done very, very effectively. In the city of St. Louis, it's a public ambulance system through the fire department, but in the city and the county, the private ambulances are a very important backup system to that. When all the fire department ambulances are out or busy, the private companies come in and take over that role. So ambulance services can be done privately and can be very effective at that. Mass transit, I already gave the independence example, so I won't repeat myself. There is a role for the greater use of private charter bus companies, other independent cab companies in providing mass transit in Missouri. And I would very much like to see that expanded. And finally, in the final minute, some are very rare, but I find interesting and intriguing examples is a, Missouri has America's only private commercial airport. I, I don't know if anybody of you knew that. Branson, Missouri is the only fully private, fully commercial airport in the country. There's all sorts of private airports for commercial, for sort of corporate jets or privately owned jets, but, but where you provide actual commercial service from city to city with major carriers, Branson's the only one. Unfortunately, they opened their airport in 2007 just as the economy was entering into difficulties and they've never really been able to recover. So I think about a year ago, people thought when Southwest entered that they were going to sort of be the thing that finally got them over the hump, hump, but now Southwest is pulling out. So I think Branson is in deep trouble. But again, that's a private investment that failed, not taxpayer, not a huge taxpayer investment that failed. Although to be fair, Branson does pay the airport a fee out of tax dollars for people, for everybody who lands. So while it's a private operation, there are some tax dollars involved. Parks. Uh, anybody here ever been to Merrimack Springs Park in St. James? Sort of a, a, it's not a state park, but it's like a state park. It's a fully private, privatized park. It's beautiful. Fishing, camping, hiking. You pay a fee to stay there overnight like most other parks. It's all private. It was endowed by a, uh, a, a wealthy person who lived in the area about a century ago. And anybody can go there tomorrow. I hear it's beautiful. One of the economists who works for us goes there regularly. But again, not an example of something that can be easily replicated. Uh, but areas like the National Forest Service contracts out management of campgrounds all across the country. Missouri, the Mark Twain National Forest in the state, all the campgrounds there are, are bid out and operated by private companies. And that's a, it's, a growing, it's a growing system in the National Park Service. Libraries. I used to serve on the University City Public Library Board. I love public libraries. We have fabulous public libraries in the city of St. Louis. But there are three counties in the state that don't have any public libraries. Uh, two of them down in the Ozarks, and one Lincoln County, which is near St. Louis, which I was surprised about. Uh, no public libraries in those areas. All, their needs for libraries are all met by private community libraries. Lincoln County, like the park in St. James, 
has a private library endowed by a wealthy resident uh, several decades ago. So again, that's not an easily replicable thing. But in Taney County, home to Branson, uh, they had a vote just last year whether to institute a public library system, taxpayer so supported, uh, to replace the, the current just sort of private book share system they had. And that vote failed miserably. In 65 to 35, it was defeated. I'm not here advocating private libraries in the state of Missouri. Just pointing out that there are a few counties where the private sector is able to meet those needs very effectively. And with that, I love this topic. I'd be happy to take any questions you have on it. If you, if, I'd love you to take copies of the study and share it with your city where, where you live, to city councilmen or, or other community activists and say, what can my city do to, to uh, consider the benefits of privatization? Do you offer a municipal trash service? Does your city I live in your city. It's still a, a city-owned trash operation. I'd love them to contract it out. Um, uh, does your city, even if they contract it out, do they require a rear yard trash pickup, which adds an enormous amount of cost to it to save, to save people the toil of bringing their trash to the curb once a week? Um, that's a, all sorts of, a, yeah, there are a couple. You could guess which ones require a rear yard trash service. So, and with that, let's go to questions.